simply the Trinity. Come on. Oh, the Trinity. Oh, oh, baby. What's the Trinity? Well, tri being three, amen. Amen. Entity comes from unity, amen. amen. So it's the unity of the three, it's the Trinity. Come on. Now, who are the three? God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Let's pray to our God. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. God, right now we want to ask that you fill us with your spirit. Send your angels around this room right now, Father God. Give us undivided devotion on your word. Transform us and change us as we contemplate the mysteries of the ages. As we contemplate your nature and who you are. Give us great insight. We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The church began, first principal students, what year? 29 AD. 33 AD, traditional date, 29 AD, most likely the actual date, amen? So you're both right. And the church expanded powerfully through that first century. And it started to experience persecution, mostly from the Jews and religious folk. But as time went on, the Romans got involved. Second century, we had intense persecutions. Christians being thrown to lions and animals and all kinds of barbaric stuff. And it never stopped God's church. Amen. See, persecution from the outside simply makes the church stronger. Amen. Makes the church more powerful. Yeah. Yeah. But what did stop the church was division from the inside. Constantine became emperor of Rome and legalized Christianity to be able to be practiced as a religion. And yet this controversy arose from one of the bishops in Alexandria named Arius. And you may have heard of what's called the Arian controversy. And what Arius said is he started teaching, you know, Jesus Christ, yes, he's important, son of God is what he's called, but he's a created being. Meaning, he had a beginning at some point. You see, he goes, what the scripture means when it says that Jesus is begotten of God was that he was created and not eternal. He's not been co-eternal with the Father. Now, the other bishops, one in particular, um, another guy named um, uh, Anthesinus, his, and it was actually his bishop who was really at the beginnings of the controversy, but then he was kind of the one that, that um, uh, really debated uh, Arius. He goes, no, Jesus Christ, historically, the apostles taught, and the New Testament, we understand, teaches, was always with the Father and is God and is a different person than God the Father, but is God at the same time. You go, wrap your mind around that one, amen? amen. But that's what our faith is always taught. And so Constantine goes, all right. You know, I'm trying to unify the empire, and Christianity is going to be my way to do it. And if Christianity is divided, then I'm definitely not going to unify the empire. So I'm going to call a council. And for the first time, they had what became known as the Council of Nicaea, where they had all the bishops come together. And it was pretty significant, guys. He literally had a big feast for them and treated these guys like kings. And you had literally one bishop there who had his eye out because he had been in the Colosseum earlier with those wild animals. And so this was such a radical shift in Rome that now these guys that were viewed as the scum of the earth and persecuted are now being treated like kings. And he goes, guys, I've gathered you all together. Take this week. Discuss amongst yourselves. I need an answer on what we're going to believe. <laughs> so they debate and they discuss. And as God would have it, the historical faith won. Amen. Yeah. And they came out with what was known as the Nicene Creed. And I want to read it to you guys. It's a beautiful creed. Uh, we don't believe that this is scripture. We don't hold to creeds. We hold to the Bible. Amen. Amen. But this creed displays what the scriptures teaches. They said, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of all things, visible and invisible. In one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I only begotten of his Father, of the substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, both that are in heaven and in earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate and was made man. He suffered, and the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven. And he shall come again to judge the living and the dead, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. And the church says, and it goes on. If you read the whole thing, I mean, it talks about we believe in a baptism for the remission of sins. Amen. Yeah. I mean, 
they always taught the truth about Christianity in those early days is over time that things started to get polluted. Are you with me right here? Yeah. But you've got to understand your view on how you view the Trinity has a huge influence on how you see the sacrifice of Christ. I'll give you an example. If Jesus wasn't a different person than God the Father, let's pretend Jesus is also God the Father, what's called modelism. That means that God just morphed down here on earth, that really when he's praying, he's just praying to himself, and that when he died on the cross, it was no big deal because he was God. It's just like, this doesn't really hurt. I'm just God. That, see, how you view the Trinity affects what you believe. If Jesus is just a lesser God or just a son of God, that's going to affect your discipleship because you go, well, I don't really know how much authority this guy really has. Wow. It's so sad. Today there are teachings out there, well, Jesus, he's a son of God like I'm a son of God. And, and he just had such a consciousness <laughs> that he felt the vibrations of spirituality. He was so close to God, you know, and he just... He raised above at a conscious level. No one has like Confucius and Buddha. And maybe a few guys have achieved this level. <coughs> kind of new age religion teaching out there. And you go, well, okay, so I don't have to obey that guy. That's, he's not God. I just need to try to somehow be, you know, this super spiritual quasi person. Wow. Yeah. So how you view the Trinity affects your Christianity. Now, on, for today's sermon, I'm not going to focus so much on the Holy Spirit Although the Holy Spirit, he's a person, amen? amen? And the Holy Spirit is called God in Acts chapter 5. With Ananias and Sapphira, Peter goes, how could you lie to the Holy Spirit? You've not lied to men, you've lied to God, amen? amen? In Corinthians, the Holy Spirit is called Lord. And so he is part of the Trinity. And I think by talking about Jesus and the Father's relationship, we'll understand that relationship as well, amen? amen. We need to start, one of the confusions that comes with the Trinity is defining the word God. When we hear the word God, we automatically think of a person, if you will. But God, in some ways, is like a title. It literally means deity, amen? The deity, the divine. And so, when we talk about God being one... We are talking about one deity, one divine will and purpose for humanity. You with me right here? Mm -hmm. So when Jesus said, for example, on earth, apart from the Father, I could do what? Nothing. Nothing. We understand they were so unified. So the oneness of God is one in their unity, not one in their person. Are you with me right here? And we'll see that clearly in the scriptures. Understand that one is talking about plurality and unity. And then, of course, individually, they are all called God. God is called God the Father. And I'll give you a few scriptures I'll rattle off. First Corinthians 8, 6. The Son is called God. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. Amen. It's the prophecy about him being born in Bethlehem. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Amen. Amen. Of course, John 20, verse 28 when Thomas sees the resurrected Jesus, he goes, my Lord and my God. Yeah. He understood Jesus was just as much deity as God the Father Amen. was deity. Pretty significant. The Holy Spirit's called God. Acts 5, 3 through 4. Three persons in divine plurality and individuality. God is like the word in some ways sheep. The word sheep can be plural and it can be singular. Amen. Amen. John chapter 1, let's turn there. Get in the Bible, amen? John chapter 1. My hope today and my heart for the church, I was talking to Chanel and a few people about this, is that I think we need to get deeper in our faith. And I think we need to think about our faith more. There's too many superficial Christians that don't know why they believe what they believe. And guys, we are in the Athens of America being in Boston. One of the intellectual capitals of the world. People need to come and know we can discuss our faith and that our faith is true and reasonable. Oh, Amen? Not oh, just blind. First principles, go no, make disciples. Yay! I don't know why I believe what I believe. I'm just doing it because it's a cool group. It's like, no, I know why I believe what I believe. Come on. I can defend it. When someone goes, I don't think Jesus is God. I just think he's an angel. Like the Jehovah's False Witnesses, right? You go, okay, well, let's look in the Bible. Where does it say that in the scriptures? Come on. Mm. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. 
the Trinity is what makes Christianity unique to every world religion. Yeah. Muslims go, well, we believe in one God. You guys say you believe in one God, so it's kind of the same thing. No, it's not. We can both believe in Texas, but if I say Dallas is the capital and you say Fort Worth is the capital, that's, we don't believe in the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of the day, we believe in a triune God. John chapter 1. John was written to help people understand two things. That Jesus is God. He's deity. Amen. And secondly, that Jesus was also fully human. John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The word in the Greek is uh, logos. So it's the idea of the concept. Jesus was around from the beginning and was with God the Father and also was God, deity. But we'll see from the scriptures here in a moment, he was not God the Father. He was, Jesus would be the Son. Here he's called the Word in his pre-incarnate state. Amen? Look at verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And this is known as the incarnation, that Jesus came into humanity to live like one of us. Is that pretty cool? Yeah. That's what he did. Now, how do we understand this? The word was with God and is God. You know, the son, Jesus has an origin in the Father, but origin does not mean beginning, okay? And, and this is, and I really wanna make sure you keep with me on this because this is really important. Um, origin can mean like the source of. So let me give you an example. This is how the early Christians understood this historically. They would use the sun as an example. So we know the sun, you have the orb, the ball of fire. You've got the rays that bring down the light, the light rays, right? The source of the origin of those light rays is what? The ore, the ball of fire. But as long as the ball of fire has been around, so has the light rays. Are you with me right here? So don't get faked out by false cults that tell you that, oh, Jesus had a beginning at some point. No, he had an origin, quote unquote, but it was because he came from the very divine nature, that deity from God the Father himself. He's always existed. He is co eternal with the Father. Are you with me right here? And we'll get more into this here. You'll see it scripturally. But understand then the heat that we feel here on earth, the light rays and the ball of fire are three scientifically separate things, and yet they are all one in unity. Amen? So the ball of fire would be like God the Father, the light rays would be like Jesus Christ, and the heat we feel on earth may be like the Holy Spirit, to use the analogy that the early Christians used. And that's a good analogy because, you know, one of the bad analogies people use is water. Oh, you know, it's like H2O, and, you know, one's the solid form, and one's the gas, and one's the, the uh, liquid. liquid, thank you. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, that's a terrible analogy because God did not, like, morph into, like, Jesus. And I'm really God the Father, but I'm just acting like I'm praying to someone up there. You know what I mean? Like, that's not what happened. The sun's a better analogy because those are actually three different components versus the water that's all the same, just kind of morphing it in different forms. That's why I like the sun analogy uh, a little better. But I think the Bible gives us some analogies we can even understand a little deeper level. A couple things real quick that we need to understand. Um, there are three persons that share the same nature. Now, nature is an important word. The Nicene Creed used the term substance, the same thing, nature. And I'll talk about that here in a moment. But a couple scriptures you can write down. Luke chapter 3, verse 21 through 22 is the baptism of Jesus. That's significant because you see all three persons there. Jesus Christ is getting baptized by John, and who comes down and descends? The Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. And then, of course, God the Father, you hear his voice, this is my son, with whom I'm well pleased. Amen? All three persons are present at the baptism of Jesus. Acts chapter 7 is really significant. Acts 6 and 7, of course, you have uh, the first Christian martyrdom of Stephen, and Stephen preaches a scathing message. And then they're about to stone him and kill him. And you know what Stephen sees? The Holy Spirit's present there with him, the Bible says. He looks up and he sees God Almighty on his throne, the Father, and who's standing at his right side? 
Jesus Christ. Amen. Three persons in one unity and divine will. Look in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to look in verse 26 at the creation of man, and I think this will help us understand a little bit. Genesis 1 and verse 26. Anthony, you might hand me that copy that's right under there. Thank you. Sorry for the water. They had these little Dixie cups. I'm like, that's, that's not going to last. You know, there we go. Okay, Genesis 1, verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make... Okay, we got to stop right there. If you're, if you're, if you're thinking critically, you're, you're, something just jumps out at you right there. Like God singular... Or sorry, God singular said, Let us, plural... Make man in our image. I think we see some hints of the Trinity there. Now, admittedly, this could be the idea of the heavenly host as well, meaning the angels that were created prior, but Job teaches us they were there celebrating at creation. So understand that is a debated view that's out there. To me, though, it makes sense that the Trinity to be present because in Colossians 1, it says that Jesus was there and it was through him that everything was made. And so when it says, let us make man in our image, then we've got to consider mankind himself. 1 Thessalonians 5, and again, give me a lot of scriptures, so you've got to write them down. 1 Thessalonians 5 teaches that man is a tripart being. Body, soul, and spirit, amen? amen? So we're made in God's image, so we can understand this. You know, if some tragedy happens and Jordan Wilson was, like, dead, right? Someone killed him or something like that. We understand as Christians... That his spirit goes before God. Now, if you want to know more about this, you've got to come back next week. We're going to talk about the afterlife. And all, all the singles are going to miss out, amen, but they'll have to watch the sermon. We're going to talk about heaven and hell, what happens when you die. It's going to be a lot of fun. Devo, Friday, we'll come to a debate. So what we do now is we debate uh, certain topics, and then we preach about it on Sunday. It's kind of what we do at Devo on Friday, and then we come here. It's a lot of fun. So we had a great debate, by the way, on the subject of the Trinity uh, Friday night at the campus Devo. Um, <clears throat> what was I talking about? Okay. So, the body, soul, and spirit. Jordan's dead. The Bible says his spirit is now present with God. And if Peter's up there, something, he's going to go, oh, it's Jordan Wilson. The police go, hey, Christina, can you identify this body? Yeah, that's really sad, isn't it? Sorry. Okay, let's use, uh, you know, Brian. There we go. <laughs> Brian comes in. Hey, Brian, can you identify his body? He goes, that's Jordan Wilson. Wait a second. In heaven, Jordan Wilson. Here on earth, Jordan Wilson. Are, are any of them wrong? No. No. It's the body and the spirit. <laughs> Two separate things in that analogy, or persons, if you will. Amen. Same person. Wow. It's kind of interesting. Not even the same person. The, the, right, the right, and the analogy breaks down a little bit because the right terminology would be the same nature. And this is what we're going to talk about here in a little bit. So nature deals with the class of which you belong. Our, our, the founders of America were onto something when they said all men are cre created equal. Meaning there's no human that's less human than somebody else. And when someone treats someone like that, then you know you're not living according to God's will anymore. And that's all another sermon for another time. But the idea is that we're all part of this human nature. That's what makes us equal in that sense. It's not equal and everyone gets the same things or every, you know, everyone you know, uh, has the same job or the same role or something like that. And that creates problems too. Yeah. It's that we're equal in the fact that we are all human. So God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are all co-equal in the fact that they are of the divine nature. Their attributes are different, just like me and my brother have different attributes. Yeah. Me and another church member have different attributes. So we might, you know, think of God maybe as more the, the father, the disciplinarian, and maybe Jesus and the Holy Spirit are more the gentleman or the comfort or whatever. This is a fun study to do on your own time is to look at the qualities and the attributes of each one. You're going to find some differences, but complete unity yeah. and equal yeah. in their divine nature. That's why the King James calls it the Godhead. Are you with me right here, guys? Let's go to Philippians chapter 2.
One of the things that causes people problems in understanding the Trinity is this idea of ordering. And, and I encourage you, there's a great uh, uh, scholar guy named uh, David Bur uh, Burso who writes uh, a book called Will the Real Heretics Please Stand Up? We sell it sometimes in the back of church. Uh, but he also does some great teachings on this. Uh, he's someone I used to research for this sermon. I encourage you to dig into this and find out what did the Christians of the Bible times believe mm -hmm. about this. And we're going to look here in uh, Philippians 2. And this is going to explain something that throws us off is the idea of ordering, right? Different roles. So when God created man and woman, myself and my wife, for example, in marriage, we have different roles. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, who's the head of the wife? The husband. Does that mean like she's not equal to me or something or inferior or all this kind of stuff? No. no. We just have different roles, right? right? And so in the same way, the Bible actually says, and this will throw some people off, in 1 Corinthians 11, who's the head of Christ? God. God. 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus takes the kingdom and gives it to God. Yeah. And, and this helps us then with scriptures where Jesus is like, no one is good except God the Father and things like that. We understand there's a different ordering and a different roles, but it doesn't make him less God, less eternal, or that he had to have been born at some point. And we'll talk about his incarnation. He was born in the womb, but he existed in a pre-incarnate state for eternity, right? The word was God and was with God from the beginning. Look in Philippians 2 and verse 5. Your attitude, some translations say like mindset, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Amen? Amen. This scripture is so clear. Jesus and God are equal. And yet Jesus goes, Somewhere in divine eternity past, they knew man would sin, and so the divine trinity goes, who's going to go down there? Jesus goes, I will. The words. Come on. He became one of us, making himself in human likeness, and he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Meaning, he could have come down and just been like, shooting lightning bolts and like flying around and going, I'm God, you know, worship me. And everyone would have been like, you know. Yeah. He didn't do that. For atonement to work, he had to be fully human. Now, there's, there's a couple different ways people interpret the Greek of this verse, and, and admittedly, it's a controversy a little bit. So when it talks about in verse 7, he made himself nothing, that can also be translated, he emptied himself. It's the idea he emptied himself of divinity. Now, I think that's false. That'd be too far to go because... Uh, John makes it clear he was always divine. Are you with me right here? He's the divine son of God. But what the scripture seems to point out is that he chose not to use that divinity. And this is why he never did a miracle until he was what? Baptized. And he had to rely on the Holy Spirit just like you and I did. And every miracle he did was based on his faith and his trust and his relationship with God because he's showing us how to live as Christians. So when he died on the cross, he said, God, why have you forsaken me? That was a real separation. Amen. He had to deal with human emotions and fears and challenges. Hebrews chapters 2 through 4 talk about how he was tempted in every way as we are. Yeah. But never sinned. And I think sometimes we think, well, that's Jesus. He had God-like abilities. No. He became human and he can relate to you and I and that's why we can have a relationship with him. Is that pretty awesome? Amen. No other world religions God can do that. But we have Jesus who shows us how to live like God. And he had to trust and again I'm not going to talk a lot about the Holy Spirit today but he had to trust the Holy Spirit. His role was that he would resurrect him from the grave. This took an incredible amount of trust and faith and he talks about that in wow. Romans. You know, when we think about all of this today, we need to understand that we worship a triune God who is perfectly one and united. That unity surpasses. This is where the mystery comes in. This is where you have to have faith. The unity is so strong, we can say we're monotheistic. He's one God. Yeah, right. That's where the faith comes in. Some people go, I don't know. That's borderline, bro. Like polytheism or something. Well, it may sound borderline, but we didn't cross the line. It's, it's totally one God yeah. in perfect unity. This refutes this oneness garbage that's out there. 
And this is where people teach. And we've had people that come to our church who struggle with this stuff. Mm -hmm. They teach that the father, like I said, morphed down and he was Jesus and all this. And so what they do then is they go, well, you can't baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You can't say that when you baptize mm -hmm. someone because on, the Father is Jesus. The Spirit is Jesus. You can only baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. You ever study with anyone ever study with someone that, that believes that or something? Yeah. Okay. That, that's the teaching that's out there. As if in the name is some type of formula or something that, that you're, you're right. saved by or some magic charm or word right. that you just say and boom, you're saved. That's ridiculous. And the name deals with being baptized under the authority of the Holy Trinity, under the authority of God. And we'll talk about that a little later. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. And then I'm going to just simply close with a couple of three points on how this affects us practically. Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, we're going to look in verse 15. And this is a beautiful passage here. Colossians 1 verse 15. It's talking about Jesus. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Again, false teachers will try to twist this and go, there it is. Jesus was born. But remember, firstborn in the Bible means preeminence. Number one, importance. Say, so how do you know that, Mike? You know, Israel is called God's firstborn son. Now, was Israel the first nation that ever existed on the planet? No. No, even in the Bible, it wasn't. And so you go, oh, well, no. It's preeminent. That was God's chosen nation in the Old Testament. So firstborn always deals with preeminence. Look at this in verse 16. It says, for by him, so who are we talking about? Jesus. All things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. So which person of the Trinity did the creation? Jesus. Pretty cool. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Amen. Understanding God's divine nature is going to help you hold your life together. Amen. Amen. And sometimes you just go, oh, this is a lot of philosophical talk. I don't understand what's going on. But you need to put your mind to contemplate on God's glory. That's part of being a Christian. Amen. You need to think about your faith. You've got to worship. You've got to ask questions of the text. That's right. And what you read in the Bible. You know, Colossians 2, verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. And he's writing a lot of this because there's already false teachers in, the, in the, the second century and stuff that were confused about Jesus. Some people thought Jesus was just like a phantom that didn't really exist, but he just it looked like there was somebody there. <laughs> you know, some people thought that, well, he wasn't God. He's just some prophet or uh, a man, you know, an angel, whatever. The Bible totally refutes all these ideas. And verse nine, it says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the what? Deity. Deity. That's what the King James translates, Godhead lives in bodily form and you've been given fullness in christ who's the head over every power and authority okay this is pretty cool Amen. in jesus christ we can see the fullness of the godhead Amen. now this is even more awesome you've been given it as a christian wow come on bro what's that even mean i don't know but it's cool <laughs> It shows me that fullness in life comes by being a Christian Amen. and focusing on Jesus. We have a Christ-centric religion. Are you with me right here? That focuses on Christ. So there's three things that I think the Trinity helps us with in our lives. Number one, the Trinity makes God known to us. The Trinity makes deity, the divine. People are on a quest trying to figure out, how do I connect spiritually? How do I connect to the spiritual world? Go to John chapter 1 again. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. In John 1, in verse 14, we read that the word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. That's the theological term that gets used is incarnation for that. He came to earth. And then look at this. Drop down, if you will, to verse 17. It says, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Yes. No one has ever seen God. But God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Now, you've got to think about this verse for a moment. Mm -hmm. No one's ever seen God. Well, anyone who's read their Bible, all of a sudden is going to have a list of problems with this. <laughs> Say, why is that? Maybe someone in the crowd knows. Why? Moses. Moses. 
Jacob wrestled God. Abraham had dinner, you know, lunch with God or whatever, right? So if no one's ever seen God, the Father, then who was that they saw? Jesus the Son. Are you with me right here? Jesus is what helps us know God. The divine being that's on the throne. And by looking to Christ, as the Bible says in Hebrews, he is the express image. He's the image of his Colossians, the invisible God. Amen. Amen. And so the Trinity, in particular, Jesus Christ, helps us know God. We need a flesh and blood example. You say, well, Jesus isn't walking around on the earth anymore today. Well, John 1.14 says the word became flesh. We can look in the scriptures to look at Jesus, but here's what I want to challenge you with. He is here today on earth, and this is where the church comes in to the Trinity. The church is called the what of Christ? The body of Christ. You know, well, I'll save that for later. But understand that, that if you're visiting today and you don't know God the Father, and you're interested in this stuff, and, and, and maybe you've grown up going to church, but you feel like your religion is dead, you go, I don't, really, I don't feel that fullness of life. I want to challenge you to study the scriptures with someone yes. and understand that it's not enough just to see the scriptures. The scriptures have to be alive, yes. meaning that when people come into our church, they, we are the Bibles that they read. Yes. They need to see Jesus Christ. And that way, God can be made known to them. Many are trying to get to know God through his creation. I can't tell you how many people worship the universe and stuff. I mean, just go to Barnes & Noble and look at the New Age section and yeah. talk about, oh, get these leaves and these herbs and sit out there and do, you know, it's like, what? <laughs> like, that makes no sense. No sense. Why would you want to worship the creation when you could worship the creator? Yeah. That's the point. Right. Meditation and mindfulness, uh, though can have you know benefits mentally speaking. I, nothing unbiblical about that. Gets unbiblical though when that's how you're trying to get to know God. Yeah. And you're trying to go, oh, you know, let me feel something or whatever. And this is what other world religions uh, teach about sometimes trying to get to know God. Uh, philosophy and teaching. I mean, gosh, we live in a city that that education's their god. Yeah. And, and, and how many of our campus students even struggle sometimes to put the kingdom first because they, they're worshiping education instead? Right. Yeah. And, and, and what happens is, is that when that becomes God, you're trying to look for answers to life's deepest questions through science and things that will not have an answer that are, to, that are divine in nature. Yeah. You know, if you look uh, with me in John chapter 17, you can only know God. I'm sorry, John 8, excuse me. John chapter 8. You can only know God through following Jesus. Amen. Yeah. And I want, to, I want to challenge anyone who's visiting or a guest or, or maybe you haven't really read your Bible in a while. In John 8, verse 31, it says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Amen. Then you will know the truth, yes. and the truth will set you free. Amen. I don't know about you, I wanted to know truth growing up, even as a kid. I was like, what is the truth? What's life all about? Amen? And it's not what the many false churches would tell you, oh, just believe in God and that's good enough. He goes, no, you've got to hold to the teachings of Jesus Christ. And the way you find his teachings is through the New Testament. It's not sitting in the woods somewhere meditating. You got to read the scriptures. And as you get to know the scriptures, it's not enough just to read and get a knowledge of what he teaches. You have to practice the truth. You got to hold to what Jesus teaches. And the Bible says, then you'll know the truth. You'll know God, brothers and sisters. Amen. You're going to know God. You're going to know that life to the full. And you're going to be set free. Free from oppression. Free from the sins that brought you down. Right? Yeah. Free from addiction. Free to have a purpose in life. That's yeah. what God offers. And the Trinity helps make known God Amen. to us. Number two. Look in John 17. Come on, girl. Come on, girl. Come on, girl. The Trinity is to be seen in the unity of the church. Yes. The Trinity is to be seen in the unity of the church. And this also deals with our marriages, as I'll talk about here in a moment. So in John chapter 17 and verse 20, Jesus is praying one of his most intimate prayers before he's about to die. And he says this for us. He's praying for all of us. Check this out. He says, my prayer is not for them alone, meaning just the apostles. 
I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, the New Testament, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. And the church says, Jesus' last prayer is that the church would be brought to a complete unity unity Amen. and not just any kind of unity like oh we all believe in jesus or we all get along or wow that guy's you know the same political party as i am and that guy's the same into the same no he goes this unity has to resemble the same unity jesus says that i have with the father the church is to be that unified is that intense or what we understand from the bible that marriage reflects the trinity God made man in his image, and the Bible says on day six, he made man, male and female. But at that point, where was that female at? Inside Adam. One. She gets taken out of Adam and created for him and he for her. And there's a oneness as a man leaves his father and mother, the, the two shall become one. one. Now, on a side note, we understand me and Chanel aren't one person and mesh together or something like that, right? Like, like weird. Amen. We're one in our Amen. unity. Amen. I'm just helping you understand the Trinity again, in case you forgot. Come on, girl. In case you forgot. But this is powerful because then it encompasses the church. Because remember that Eve came from Adam's side. Well, Jesus is called the first Adam. And you got to remember that when Jesus was crucified, they stuck a spear in his side and blood and water came out. And this blood and water, of course, foreshadows the baptism. Yes. When we're baptized, the church was created for Jesus. Amen. The church is the bride of Christ. Yes. The Trinity encompasses the church. The church is in the Trinity's bosom. Is that pretty cool? That's awesome. And that's why Ephesians chapter 5 says, hey, marriage? The Ephesians 5 says... Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And Ephesians 5 then says, Husbands, serve your wives as Christ serves the church, willing to die for them. Yeah. He goes, but I'm not talking about this marriage. Yeah. He goes, I'm talking about the relationship between the church and Jesus. Yeah. Does your marriage reflect the Trinity? Come on. See, sometimes we allow sin and things to come in and divide us. And we don't fight for that unity. We go, my unity is at stake in my marriage. I need to be like Christ, willing to die and forgive Amen. so that we can come together in unity. Amen. Yeah. Amen. But we're talking about the church as a whole. You know, I believe there's three things that bring the church together in complete unity that I really want to talk about today. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4 and verse 4, the Bible says, there is one body. So how many churches are there? One. Well, from God's sight, it's just all the true disciples around the world. He sees us right. as all one church. Amen? Right. One body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, when you were called to one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who's over all, and through all, and in all. You go, oh man, I, I was baptized like three times as a baby, and here and there. Well, God goes, no, there was one that was true. Amen. Or maybe not. And you need to have the one baptism, amen? amen. If you're busy and you don't understand what baptism is or know why you got baptized or why you believe, you need to study the Bible today because it's important. Yes. Yes. And he goes, there's seven doctrines here that unify the church. The fact that the church is to be one. The fact that there's one Holy Spirit that's received at baptism. That there's one baptism, there's one faith. Newsflash, you can't be saved and not be a Christian. Muslims aren't going to heaven. Hindus, Jews. You go, Mike, that's a broad statement. You don't know them. They don't believe in Jesus. Come on, Mike. John 14 says that the only way you can get to the Father is through Christ. 
And, and, and if someone's offended, I would challenge you to look at the Bible and question yourself, why am I at church in the first place? And secondly, if I'm at church, then I somewhat agree the Bible has something to offer me. And so I need to study it. Are you with me right here? I got to get deep into it. Our doctrine is what unites the church. But I put before you, that's not even enough for complete unity. There's more scriptures that talk about unity. See, there are other churches in our town and around the world that believe you need to be unified on these seven things. And they teach these seven things correctly. But they are not working together to evangelize the world. Because personality conflicts come in. Look at this. Secondly, is reconciliation is what helps the church stay unified. Go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, when you understand the Trinity, you go, man, I value unity. In Philippians 4, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. And in verse 2, he says, I plead with Judea and I plead with Synecdoche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with the Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Remember in John 17, Jesus said unity had to be brought together. Yes. Doesn't happen naturally just because we're all nice people. Come on. Like it has to be brought together. And Paul is writing to the whole church in Philippi. He goes, there's these two sisters that just won't get along in the church. No. And he names them. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine, like, you got up here, I just named, hey, this brother over here and that brother over there will not get along. Everyone be like, woo! <laughs> but that's what Paul did. He goes, man, I love these sisters. They've helped me so much in the work of the gospel, but I'm pleading, I need the whole church's help to make sure that they're 100% unified. Because Paul knew the fullness of God and believed in the Trinity and knew that the purpose of Jesus' prayer was so that the world will know that Jesus came from God. Our unity is evangelistic. You know why I think the church slowed down a little bit this last summer? I think it's because we've tolerated disunity. Yeah. We've tolerated disunity. You say, well, how is that, Mike? Everyone seems to get along. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Come on. And this is the third way that unity is brought in the church. This is what God instituted. As you're turning there, we know in Ephesians 4, he designated some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists and pastors and teachers of God's people so that the church would be built up and unified. The role of leadership in the church is simply to bring people together. Amen. You say, why don't we have midweek on Thursday night instead of Wednesday night? Because I chose to do Wednesday night. Come on, bro. And you go, well, you chose that. What's that mean? Well, let's look in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. Come on, bro. Obey your leaders. Some translations say have confidence in your leaders. And submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Yeah. How's unity brought together? Obedience to leadership. Yeah. We're not talking about if a leader calls you to do something against the Bible or something right. like that, or how these cults or the weird denominations get started. So that's not what we're talking about. Unity comes from deciding I am not only going to be submissive to God, in fact, you can't be submissive to God unless you're also submissive to men. Right. See, that's a tough teaching, Mike. Mm -hmm. It's a tough teaching. Our church grows the fastest, and more people are saved when every member is totally, completely unified and submitted to their leadership. Amen. And I'm not talking about just me. I'm talking about their Bible talk leader. We have too many Christians that are not going to Bible talk. Too many Christians that are not going to midweek. A lot of young Christians never went to first principles. They're just, I just guess they didn't want to do it or something. And yet this is what the leadership's called. If you're a member of this church, every disciple comes to Sunday morning church, Wednesday midweek. And if you're a college or a teen student, Friday night devotional, amen. Now, I understand every once in a while something's going to happen, but we're unified, so I communicate. To not communicate is to be disunified. And you can't be a member of the church disunified. Right. It's not going to work. And you make your leader's life a burden. I, so sad. I, I talked to the teen ministry the other day. I just, I just sat down in admonishment. Uh, some of these people put a Mecca and Lucia through hell. Come on. I'm serious. They make their life a burden. Come on, Come on, some of the teens do that are not committed to coming to every single service. Wow. Not committed to working and communicating. It's a sin. This, is it in the book, guys? People are looking at me shocked. It's in the book. It's a sin. And I don't know about you. I want to save Boston. 
But God's not going to bless a group that's disunified. I think we can learn from Jesus and God the Father's relationship. Look at this in John chapter 5. Come on, Mike. Preach, Mike. John chapter 5. Come on, Mike. In John 5, in verse 19, welcome to the Boston Church. You get unfiltered preaching. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I have to stand and give an account before God. That, that, that verse convicts me. That's not like, yes, everyone gets to follow me. No, I've got to submit to leadership too. And, and understand, like, I have to give an account for how I led the church. And if I don't say something about sin in the church then I'm going to stand before God for that. And I care about every single soul going to heaven. You don't know how many hours people spend on their knees praying for you and crying over your soul. You go, bro, I just missed Bible talk. Not a big deal. No, it's a big deal because we are committed to a vision. We are family. Are you with me right now? We don't want anyone to go to hell. In John 5, look at Jesus in his relationship with, with God. We forget Jesus was discipled by God the Father. I love this. In John 5, in verse 19, it says, Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. Now, here's my question. Do you think you can do something by yourself? He says he can only do what his father does because whatever the father does, the son also does. That's some imitation right there. Yeah. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he's pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son or not honor the father does not honor the father who sent him. Drop down to verse uh, 39. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Woo! This might sound blasphemous. The Bible is not enough to save you. How many people have Bibles sitting on their de desk collecting right. dust that do nothing? Right. The Bible, the scriptures are to be studied to lead you to who? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Come on, bro. How are people led to Jesus today? His body. Yeah. So when people come into our church, they have to see love and unity. Isn't that why you became a disciple? I don't know about you, but I saw the love and I saw the hugs. And I saw the, I was like, this is unreal. Black, white, Asian. Like, like, this is crazy. There's nothing like this going on. I mean, Sundays in Boston are one of the most segregated Sundays. You got churches that are all white and all black and all this. That's not what God intended. Right. So when people see this unity, it's powerful, but it comes by being like Jesus to your discipleship partners, to your brothers and sisters. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20 is a scripture I want everyone to memorize. Verse 21, excuse me. Ephesians 5, verse 21. So if I remember, I might ask Put some people on the spot next week, okay? Come on. Now, if you're visiting, I won't put you on the spot. Don't worry. Long-term people. Ephesians 5, verse 21. Submit to who? One another. One another out of? Reverence for Christ. I submit to Raphael. Not because he's perfect or we like the same things, but out of fear of God, a reverence for Christ. That's the mentality we have to have with each other. People that are late don't value unity in the church. I'm not talking about one time or you got, you know, some car accident happened in front of you or whatever. Amen. Stuff happens. I'm talking about people that are late that don't communicate. I'm talking about people that don't have any value for the body of Christ. It's wrong. And I hope you hear my heart today and my admonishment for us as a church. You know, finally, I want to end on a more inspiring note, is that the Trinity commissions us to save souls. The, the Trinity commissions us to save souls with authority. Go to Matthew 28. We're going to close with three verses here. Look at this. This is cool. Matthew 28. Come on, bro. Come on. Come on. In Matthew 28, verse 28, the Bible says this. Now, if you don't believe in the Trinity, I don't know of any clearer verse than this one right here, right? Come on. It says in verse 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Well, this is cool because it shows that the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are at work in saving souls as we work with them. Amen. Now, 
this has confused people. As I said earlier, some people thought, well, I need to say when I baptize someone. So when, when, you know, you'll see later when Sandra gets up here, we go, you know, we can now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You've heard some people, they get up here, they say, we can now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, or we can baptize you in the name of the Lord, or whatever. You go, oh my gosh, did they say the right one? <laughs> no, here's the news flash. They can say nothing, and they still be saved. Yeah. You say, well, well, then what's the scripture mean? And the name of deals with authority. It always has in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. So if I go to Europe, and I go to the U.S. Embassy, and I'm coming in the name of President Biden, then I'm coming with his authority. Yeah, come on. So this is pretty cool. Check this out. You don't have the president's authority. You don't have the chief of police in Boston authority. Come on, man. You don't have the mayor's authority. You have the king of kings authority. Woo! And that's what he's saying. You can go in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Spirit, and you can baptize people without authority. And then else us understand scriptures like in John where he breathes on them and he goes, you know, whoever you forgive is going to be forgiven. And people are like, what's that talking about? Like, no, she's making the point when you baptize someone, God worked through you and with you yeah. to save a soul. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. We have this commission. You know, in Revelation 2, for time I'm just going to quote it, but in Revelation 2, verses 1 through 5, we find a letter written to the church in Ephesus. And the commission to the church in Ephesus, he goes, listen, guys, you're hard lying about your doctrine. Meaning, they probably understood everything about the Trinity, right? right. But he goes, you've forsaken your first love. In Revelation 2, 1 through 5. Come on, bro. He goes, here's the solution. Do the things you did at first. Yeah. Now, I always thought about that as like when I first became a Christian, I was so excited, and, and that might be some aspect of it. But I thought, I go, I don't really want to do the things I did when I first became a Christian. Yeah, I know. Because I struggled with having quiet times. <laughs> one of the youth guys, uh, a guy named Tim, used to always have to come over and, you know, pull me out of bed, and, and we'd go and have a quiet time, you know what I mean? So I go, well, that's probably not going to help me find my, my first love again. <laughs> and I like the King James translation. It says, do the first works. The first works. I go, what are the first works? Well, we know Jesus took his guys to Galilee and gave them this commission to go and make disciples at the end of their three-year ministry. So what were the first works? Let's go to Mark chapter 1. In Mark 1, in verse 16, our last passage, it says, as Jesus walked beside the sea of what? Galilee. Galilee. So this is interesting. Jesus took them to Galilee when he gave the Great Commission, and the Trinity commissioned them with all authority for a specific reason. He wanted to remind them of the first works. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net in the lake where they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Amen. Amen. Jesus goes, come follow me. I'll give you a purpose. You're going to be involved in fishing for men. You're going to be sent out to fish for people. You see, here's the deal. You can discover the cure to AIDS. And you might help a lot of people be healed, but guess what they're still going to do? Die. Now imagine that person that discovered the cure to AIDS just kept it to themselves. Yeah, that's a selfish dude. But you know something? You have the cure to the world's problems. A cancer called sin. And so God says, do the first works to get your first love back. You got to get involved in the souls of men. And study the Bible with them, amen? Every true Christian is a Christian of men. And as you do this in the name of the authority of the Holy Trinity, you're going to know God in a powerful way. You're going to be unified with the church because you're unified with the mission of Christ. Come on. And you're going to go out with all authority. My call today as we look at the Trinity is to go, what way can I be even more unified to resemble the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And to God be the glory. Amen. Oh.